acknowledge that uh, our gathering today is centered on Treaty 1 and 2 territories. And it is this ancestral lands of the Cree, Dakota, Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Ojibwe Cree, and the Denny Nations, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nations. We are all treaty people who share responsibility for taking action on reconciliation. Without truth, justice, and healing, there can be no reconciliation. So I'll ask um, Debbie if she would uh, offer the gift of tobacco and also introduce our elder for us for tonight. Thank you, Ellen. I'll just, uh, I don't know if you all know Ellen Wood, but she is the regional chairperson of Manitoba Northwestern Ontario Kairos. Um, just in case you don't know her. And, and my name's Debbie Dandy and I am uh, uh, part of that group as well, um, living in Brandon. And um, it's an honor to uh, welcome Marge Roselli as uh, our honorary elder for our series. Um, Marge will be with us for all four sessions. And um, in her role as honorary elder, we would just invite anyone who has um, a concern or anything they hear is upsetting or triggering for them to contact Marge through the private chat and um, she'll be glad to give you support. So um, Marge, I have uh, some virtual tobacco for you, which I will do my best to get to you. And we give it to you in thanks for your teachings and uh, your wisdom along the way during our webinars. Um, our guest speaker tonight is Deborah Tatchen, and I have um, a pouch of a little parcel of tobacco as well for Deborah. Um, Marge is from Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation, and Deborah is from Brandon, and she will tell you more about her background as she speaks. So it will be easier for me to get this to you, Deborah, than it will to get Marge's to her, but I will try to make that happen. So welcome, everyone. Thank you. Uh, do we have uh, Yvonne from Kenora? Is she on the line yet? No, maybe not. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask El uh, Elder Marge if you would open our our gathering uh, with a prayer or whatever you find suitable. Yes, thank you for asking me to be the elder for these series. You know, I take um, uh, prayers and opening meetings very seriously because when we do have any discussion, presentation, or meeting, we're always asking for the guidance of uh, Creator, Wakantaka. Uh, that is how we address uh, Creator God in our Dakota language is Wakantaka. And so I always like to offer the prayer in my own first language. Uh, I grew up knowing Dakota. I didn't know English until maybe I was eight or nine years old. And when I speak with Creator, I always like to say it in Dakota. And basically what I'm doing is asking for a blessing for each and every participant that their minds will be, you know, set in a good way to hear or participate and, and learn what is being spoken about and to give us guidance in how we uh, talk and how we conduct ourselves uh, that would benefit the people. So... What I'm going to do is I'd like to offer the smoke from the sage and sage is used as a cleansing of the air, the mind, the uh, emotions that only good will come and that uh, negative will be kept away. So we use that to, in our homes to clear the homes of any negative feelings or um, negativity that is present. And when we pray, we use that to clear our minds and to make our hearts and minds open to creator's teachings and his love and his guidance. So I'll begin and uh, 
in my language. Amen. When we say was, it means we are all connected and as indigenous First Nations people, we've always believed that we are connected to all living things and all inanimate objects also. We have a connection to the rock, the trees, the grass, the land, the sky. And so when we say mitakiwas, it's an acknowledgement of that interconnection with all with all things on uh the land that the creator has given us. So that's acknowledging that. Thank you. Thank you, Marge. Just uh, for uh, kind of the flow of the time frame, we're started at 6.30. Our speaker is going to sp speak until 7.30, and then we're going to have questions from 7.30 to 8. And as Carrie has expressed, it would be helpful for us if you put your questions in the chat box. And also, if you want to introduce yourself, please do that in the chat back box as well. Um, and let us know who's all here tonight. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker tonight, Deborah DeCan. Uh, she's going to be speaking on Indigenous connections to the land. And uh, Deborah is a respected Cree Métis elder from Brandon, and she will share uh, Indigenous perspectives on all the gifts that our land gives us how we need to live in relationship with our land and to take care of it responsibly. Um, I'm sure Deborah is going to tell us a bit more about herself as she shares her knowledge and experience. And um, I'm going to give Deborah about uh, 10 minutes to wrap her, uh, her presentation up. And I'll do that just by flashing my hand in front of my face. Uh, about 10 minutes before it's, your time is up, Deborah. So please uh, go on with your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite, Debbie, to come and share a little bit. Um, it's been a journey thinking about this. You know, it's been, an, it's been a, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking and a lot of praying and, you know, remembering and, um, you know, doing all of that. So um, <clears throat> it's been a journey and I'm really happy to come and, and share a little bit tonight. And I want to say thank you because, you know, that helps in my healing. It helps in my healing journey to remember, to, just to remember. Um, um, I'm a Cree uh, Métis person. I identify as a Cree Métis person. My mother is actually Cree from, uh, my mother was Cree from um, uh, Cross Lake. Um, I have uh, roots in Cross Lake and Grand Rapids. Um, I'm from Ticket Portage, Manitoba, a small little community on, we call it the Bay Line. And uh, <clears throat> um, I was not uh, raised uh, with my family because I was part of the 60 scoop and that I was a young girl when we were taken. And uh, so I'm on my journey of healing and journey of learning to learning and coming back to learn about my own culture, my own traditions. And that's been a journey for, you know, maybe the last 30 years and learning and growing at the same time. Um, I, uh, I have five children and I have three children who grew in my heart. So I have eight children and my husband and I have 20 grandchildren and we have four great grandsons. So the work that we do is, is because of them. You know, the work that we do, my husband and I, um, 
uh, work in the community. I work in the addictions field. I work for the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba, and I, I, I work in the addictions field. But I go to the communities, and I do teachings, whatever they ask for. I always say I'm not an expert at anything, and, and um, I just take you know what they ask for and take it back to the community so to you know to try and see give them what what they're asking for so that's what my work is i was a counselor for a time at you know working working in there but before any of my work on my jobs or whatever i'm a mother and a grandmother a great grandmother and my and a partner a friend in the community and and uh, me too i'm learning you know i'm still learning who i am i'm still learning about my history learning about the history and that but all I can, you know, really do today is share my experiences about the land and about, you know, living on the land. Um, I was born, you know, up north um, in the Paw, Manitoba. That's the place where I was born. That's where we, the women used to go from my community to have a... Uh, to have their babies and I was born I was born in the Paw and I came back to Thicket Portage and and my mom couldn't look up couldn't look after me when I was a when, when I was a baby so I went to go live with my Musham. My Musham is grandfather in Cree and I went to go live with him when I was a baby so I was raised you know I was raised on uh, rabbit soup and and fish broth so I was a very chubby baby <laughs> My grandfather was, you know, my grandfather was a trapper. He had a trap line up north. And of course, we had aunties and uncles, and they looked after me for a time. And, uh, and I know, you know, when I hear the stories of the land, I know I have a good feeling about the land. Um, you know, I have a good feeling about being there. It was always a comfort for me. The land has always been a comfort. And when I, when I do my healing work or when I needed to, when I started to do my healing, especially I was out on the land a lot because that's where we really get our, you know, we really get our healing from. And then, you know, my mom came and got me from my grandfather and that was probably an interruption in my life cycle. You know, we have a natural life cycle that we follow using the medicine wheel. So that was probably an interruption in my life cycle. And then uh, after a few years, we were taken from my mom and my stepdad and we were placed in, you know, in foster care all over the place. And, and um, we were never brought back together as a family, but you know, um, the land became my comfort. I used to used to leave, you know, uh, the foster home and I, I used to go stay out in the bush. I used to go stay out in the bush and I was always happy there. I was never afraid. I was never afraid in the bush. And those are the memories that kind of came back thinking about, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, our connection to the land. Um, I would be, you know, so content out there and in the trees and, you know, um, you know, on the land, in the moss, you know, with the medicines, all of that. And I have, you know, I could, I could even smell the medicines as I was thinking about it this past week. I could smell the medicines and I was telling my husband, you know, I could smell, you know, the, the freshness of the medicines and I was walking to and from work and trying to get my connection, you know, get my connection to the, to the land. So it has always been a comfort. It has always been a comfort for me. And, uh, um, so I left up north and I lived in a little community, Ochijaku Sipi First Nation, and, uh, I lived on the Métis side, Crane River, and that's where I raised my children. And, uh, we lived along the lake. It was such a beautiful area. Um, I probably didn't realize, you know, I appreciate it as much as I do now, you know, back then, you know, when you're a young mom raising children. But I had huge gardens. And uh, some of the things that we did was, you know, um, excuse me, we hunted and fished and trapped. That was our life. That was our livelihood. And, and uh, my kids were raised on the land also. When I first moved to Crane River, we lived in a two-room log house. Um, and, uh, uh, there was about 14 of us in there. People don't realize that about me. They don't know that I live that way. You know, they're always surprised and they always go, really? And I say, yeah, and they live there. We lived right along the lake. There was the road. And then just across the road was the lake. And part of our job was to go and chop the ice and then haul water. That was part of our daily chores. We would haul water to fill up our water barrels. 
Yeah, in the winter time, that's what we did. In the summertime, that's what we did. We filled up our water barrels, and that was part of our chores. And we chopped wood, and you know, we had a little box stove, and and you know, um, um, yeah, there was a whole bunch of us that lived in the house, and it was a little log house that had mud and lime, and we mud and lime it every spring, and you know, um, you know, for getting ready for the fall, and that you know that kind of stuff. But it was when I think back, when I thought back to that time, you know, there was a a different yes we didn't have everything but there was a different feeling like a feeling of contentment yeah it was like a feeling of contentment it was okay even though you know we didn't have everything it i was still very content i uh you know i can't say that i i didn't feel that you know feeling of contentment so you know, um, hunting, fishing, trapping, all of those things I did used to, you know, my children's grandfather, he used to, he used to trap and he would bring his muskrats in the, you know, in the house after, you know, in the springtime and he would say, okay, my girl, you come here and he'll, I'll show you. So he did, he showed me how to skin the muskrat. So that became my job. So that's what I would do in the spring. You know, he'd come in carrying his muskrats and come throw them in the house. Okay, my girl, you get that done right away. Don't leave it because I don't want them to spoil. I'd be lazy to do it, right? I'd be lazy to do it. But once I started, then I'd get them all done and he'd be so happy. And then, you know, whenever he'd take his muskrats, you know, the skins to go and, you know, to go and uh, sell them, he'd always bring me a little something and he'd come and share a little something with me. And, uh, you know, and just living like that, of course, living like that. And people say, well, did you, you know, I said, I eat muskrats because that was our medicine. That was so good for us. You know, the muskrats eat the medicine, you know, they eat the roots, they eat the wheat gear, they eat all of that stuff and we eat the muskrats and it's medicine for our body. It's medicine for us. And, and, um, even when I think about it, my, my, I can feel the water in my, <laughs> because we just used to love that. You know, we used to love that. And that old lady would, you know, show me how to cook the muskrat. She'd cook it this way and, and um, you know, uh, <laughs> a certain way. And there, I'll just share this little story, a little side story is that, uh, you know, there was these dignitaries. They were coming into our community and they wanted me to cook for them. And they said, traditional food. We want traditional food. And I said, oh, that's what I should do. I should go get some muskrats. I said, well, open the roaster pans and there'll be all these little muskrats laying, <laughs> laying in the roasting pans like that. I wonder what they'll, <laughs> what they'll think. <laughs> but I cooked fish. I couldn't find any muskrats, but I cooked fish for them. <laughs> but people have a hard time to, you know, hard, hard time to see that um, because that's how we lived. You know, that's how we lived. And um you know, when I think back on my history, my, you know, my mom came back into my life when I was raising my children and she was a good storyteller. My mom, she told a lot of stories and I listened, my kids listened. And, and of course, you know, she had a lot of things to tell me about, you know, about her past and, and, uh, and uh, her great, her grandmother, my great grandmother, she was a, a midwife up north and she birthed a lot of babies up there. And my mom said that, you know, she would go with her when she was a little girl and she would go with my, you know, my, my Chapan. Chapan is, is a great grandmother in Cree. We would say Chapan. She would, she went with my Chapan and she would go and help my, you know, my grandmother and um, my grandmother, my Chapan or her grandmother, my Chapan would go and pick medicines and she knew which medicines were for the women. So she always had these medicines that she knew, you know, if a woman was bleeding too much or, you know, medicines to help with labor and, you know, stuff like that. She knew things like that. My mom never practiced that because she was pulled away from that life too. You know, my grandmother or my Chapan died when, when uh, my mom was 16, she was raised by her grandmother. So my mom had that, you know, had that knowledge in her and I became really interested and really interested in that in the medicines and learning about that and that's what I'm studying right now that's what I'm learning I'm learning about the medicines and that's what I'm drinking here you know is uh you know the medicines every day we drink a little bit you know a little bit of our medicines so my grandmother was uh my Japan was a was a 
like you know just a, a woman who knew some of the medicines for uh you know for the community and she birthed the babies and and when i started learning about this way of life i i told my mom i said boy i said mom i said everybody's a medicine woman i said you hear stories you know i heard people say yeah my grandmother was a medicine woman and then another one would say well but my grandmother was a medicine woman so i went to my mom and i said you know mom i said boy there's a lot of medicine women out there and she said yeah she said, there is my girl. She said, you know, when we were on the trap line, she said, we all had to learn the medicines. She said, we were taught from the time we were little girls that because we had to know what medicines would help our children when they got sick, you know, so they had to know, they had to learn and they learned from the time they were little. So, you know, um, you know, when people get sick now, I tell them, you know, drink some weekend, make some weekend tea, you know, things like that, you know, that she said they needed to know that. So there was, you know, um, a lot of women who knew the medicines as a result of that because they lived by themselves out in a trap line. They lived way up north or they lived on, you know, in little um, uh, villages or little bands around on the land so they had to understand the land they had to understand the medicines and they also had to understand their connection they had to understand their connection to the land and that's something that I always find amazing is how they you know they were so connected and they understood the land they understood the plants they understood you know that you know everything we were all connected everything is connected we're connected to everything around us we're connected to the trees um you know just like marge said that's you know we're all related yeah, so we're related to the trees, the sun and the moon and the stars and the wind and the rain and, you know, everything around us, we're related to that. The animals, the things that crawl, everything in the oceans, we're not separate from any of that. We're a part of all of that. And, you know, our, our people knew that and they understood that connection. You know, we had scientists, we had philosophers, we had doctors, we had teachers, we had medicine people. We had all kinds of, you know, in our in our history, we had all of those things in our history. And you know, when we look back, I look back on that with pride and I thought to myself, "Oh my gosh, we're a part of all of that." Hey? We're a part of all of that because there was a time where you know, there was a time where we didn't even know that. We weren't even aware of it. You know, we weren't even aware of all of those things. All I knew, you know, growing up was hurt, like hurt from, you know, being taken from my family and, you know, the loss and the grief and trying to survive and trying to, you know, understand life and trying to understand myself. You know, that's what I grew up as a, you know, as a young girl, as a young, you know, as a young woman. And as I got older, I started to learn about these ways. And I, I went to a, a lady in my community because I was working on my healing and I went to a lady in my community and um, I was told to go see an elder. So I did. And, and uh, if for me, it was a new concept. I was a young mother at the time. It was a new concept for me. I never really thought of it, but a friend of mine told me, go see an elder. You take some tobacco and you take her a gift and, and go and talk to her. She'll make you feel better. You'll, you'll feel better. So that's what I did. And I gave her the tobacco and I started to talk to her and, and uh, she really listened and I felt like she was hearing what I was saying. Yeah. And she was saying, Oh my girl, that must have been hard. Yeah. And she allowed me to cry and she would say, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. You let it out. Yeah. And then I cried and cried and cried and I realized I hadn't cried in many years. So once I started to cry, I cried for a long time. Hey? And, and I used to go see her all the time. And, and then she took me to the sweat lodge. And that's where I felt like I was at home. Yeah, that's I felt like I was at home. And that's where she taught me, you know, she, she taught me a lot of things. She introduced me to the smudge and to, you know, our way of life. And she started to help me understand, you know, how to heal myself <clears throat> and our connection she started to help me to understand our connection to the earth. And I would scream and I would cry in the lodge and, and she would say, that's okay. It needs to come out. Yeah, it needs to come out. She would never even touch me. She would say, I'm right here. 
Yeah, because she said if you touch somebody when they're healing like that, you interrupt that healing. So she would never touch me. She would just say, that's okay, you let it out now. It's time to let it go. So that's what I did. And so I used to use the land all the time. I used the land to release my, my hurt, my wounds. Yeah, and I used to make a hole in Mother Earth, and I would go down, and I would scream into there, and I would cry and let the tears fall. And, and you know, and they'd put a little bit of tobacco. I was taught to put a little bit of tobacco down and say, you know, you know, miigwech, thank you for your healing. Thank you, Mother Earth, for taking care of that for me, that I don't have to carry it anymore, that I don't have to take it home to my family. And, you know, I... I uh, you know, over time, I started to, you know, I started to feel better because in the beginning, my healing was either really high or really low, really high or really low. And over time, it became like this, eh? Yeah, it became like this. And that's the way it is today because, you know, we all have high moments and we all have low moments in our life. And that's life, you know. Now we have the ability to, you know, to heal those, you know, to heal those things, okay, from the teachings of our, you know, from the teachings of our elders. And um, I always say I'm a little big, bit mixed up because I'm, you know, I'm Cree, and uh, I identify as a Cree Métis person because I live with the Métis people most of my life. And uh, I learned from the Ojibwe people, and now I married a Dakota man. So I'm a little bit mixed up. <laughs> I always say I'm a, I'm a true Manitoba girl, you know, because, you know, I, uh, you know, I have all of these things and I have a little bit of each, you know, I have a little bit of each. In my, in, in my Cree language, my, my name is Migizi Wajakus Nimuisquel. And that means Eagle Star Dancer Woman. That's my spirit name. And in Dakota, we say Wambari Wichakpe Wichiwi. That's my name in Dakota. And I say it in Cree and in Dakota and Ojibwe because of that, <clears throat> because I've gotten those teachings from, you know, from the Cree people, you know, from the Ojibwe people, um, from the Dakota people. And so I, I uh, acknowledge all the people and all our teachings. I acknowledge all our teachings from them. I don't have any teachings. I'm not a traditional person per se. I wasn't raised in the traditions, but I learned and I use aspects of our culture and, and uh, to heal myself and to heal my family. And I go back to the land always. Whenever I go through something, I go back to the land. I uh, uh, go to the sweat lodge. I use the medicines. Um, when I was healing from trauma, I use cedar. I use cedar to help heal my body. I use cedar to bath in when I was healing from that trauma. And cedar just helped. It cleansed everything. It cleansed my body, my spirit, my mind. Um, you know, it helped cleanse you know cleanse everything so I go to the land whenever I need to heal I go and sit out on the land I go out and fast um, every year I still you know go out and fast I used to go four days and four nights and go fast and sit out there and pray but I don't do four days anymore I'm getting too old for that I do two days <laughs> two days is good now I do two days on and I sit out on the land and I pray and I talk to, you know, I talk to the creator and talk to our ancestors, our grandmothers and grandfathers. I talk to the land, I talk to the trees, I talk to the wind, you know, if it's raining, I'll talk to the rain. And I give thanks, I give thanks for, you know, being allowed to heal, you know, be having the opportunity to heal and the opportunity to sit on the land. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, everything that happens teaches you something. Um, you know, the wind comes from someplace, eh? it comes and it's almost like it's whispering to you as it passes you, you know, and you, when you're sitting out there and you're in that space, you hear the wind and it's coming and you give thanks in a hot summer day when you're out there fasting under that sun and all of a sudden that wind comes and it says, I'm here, I'm here. You know, you can hear those words and you look around and you're looking at everything. You're looking at the trees and you're looking at the birds and you're looking at the insects that are, you know, crawling around on, you know, looking at the spiders that are making their webs and you're looking at, you know, the, the, you know, the owl that's sitting up in the tree and you're, you know, you're looking at all these things, the grass, the way it's growing, the flowers, the way they're blooming, you know, they're thirsty maybe and you're going, you know, and you're thinking I'm thirsty too. So that's must be how those plants are feeling. And then, you know, as you're observing, 
you're looking around and you realize you're being observed too. Yeah, the trees are watching you. They're going, look at this strange creature sitting out here starving herself and thirsting herself. Why is she doing that? You know, and maybe the birds are looking at you and maybe they're bringing you comfort. You know, the birds come and sing, hey. And then the owl comes there and makes their little noise, their little whirling sound at night. And, you know, teaching you something and bringing you stories, you know. And, and uh, you know, the spider that's spinning its web there and, and you're looking at it kind of like the trickster, right? It's kind of trying to trick you because I was watching this one, one time I was watching this spider. And I was watching it for a long time and then all of a sudden it just came down and right into my face and it made me jump like this it made me jump really hard scared the crap out of me seriously i thought oh my god you know and then i imagined that little spider going <laughs> just laughing laughing at me because i was scared it scared the crap out of me but you know those are the gifts that were given right those are the gifts that were given you know with the land and that's why I'm so thankful. I'm so every day, you know, every day I'm thankful. I walk to work and I look at the trees and, you know, it's like 15 blocks from where I live, but I walk, I walk home. I get up in the morning and I walk, you know, I, I, in the winter time, I like getting up around five o'clock and I walk and I love that sound of <coughs> when you're walking on the earth and it's quiet you know, and we call the January moon their little spirit moon because, you know, it's so quiet and, and you can just hear and you know that spirit is there and you know that you're being taken care of and it's so comforting. You know, this is what the land does. This is what the land does for us. And, you know, people all over the world, indigenous people all over the world are losing their land. They're losing their forests. You know, they're losing their water, you know, uh, some of the people in, you know, thinking of India, like places are turning to desert, you know, because of deforestation, you know, they're losing their animals, the animals help to look after the land, they're losing their water, they're losing their forests, they're losing their way of life, you know, it's, it's really, it really hurts my heart, I feel sad, yeah, I really feel sad about that. And that's why I, you know, I was happy to come in and share because I believe we need to share our stories. We need to share our stories about the land and our connection to the land. You know, our grandmothers, when they would, when a child would be born, it was seen as a sacred gift in our Cree teachings. We come from the spirit world and we come to this world and we come and we're lowered down on an umbilical cord. This is the teaching I have had from my Cree. We're lowered on an umbilical cord into the teepee. And that's what that teepee, that, that rope is on the teepee, is the umbilical cord. And then when you're born, you're born through that umbilical cord and that placenta comes. And it's such a sacred thing. The grandmothers knew what the child needed in order to grow healthy and strong. So what the grandmother would do would take the, the placenta and the umbilical cord and they would bury it under a tree and they would connect that back to the, that, that child back to the earth. That's why we are so connected to the earth. Indigenous ancestors, our indigenous ancestors and us were connected to the earth through our placentas because our placentas are buried all over this land. Yeah, and so we are we are part of that. We are part of the land. That's why it hurts us when the land is hurt. We feel that. And I really understood that when when I uh, because I had this image in my mind about the north being pristine and the land was beautiful and the, there was moss and spruce trees and you know uh, beautiful land and moss berries and moss everywhere. And I was taking a course here at ACC. And they were showing um, the land up north around Cross Lake when the hydro started flooding up there. And I just burst out crying in the middle of class, but I didn't understand why. I didn't understand, like, that was my connection to the land. I just started to cry when I saw the flooded land and the, the, the shores falling in on itself. And the people were getting cancer. And, you know, the mercury was was 
um, you know, coming up in the soil and people were eating the fish and all of those kinds of things were happening. And the fishermen were pulling out these great big spiders like the roots of the trees. And, you know, the elders tried to tell them, you can't flood permafrost land. You're going to ruin the land. You can't flood permafrost land. But they didn't listen. And so we had all this land and the shores were all falling in on itself, you know, and it just like hurt me. Like I felt like a pain in my gut and I, I was shocked. Like it was like, you know, it was almost like, oh, it was so shocking when I saw that. And I couldn't understand why I cried and I cried and I cried. But after I heard the stories and the teachings, I began to understand is because we are part of that land. We are not separate from it. We will always be part of that land. That's why it's so important for us as Indigenous people that the land is such a, it's, it's, we're part of it. We're not separate from it. That's why it hurts us. That's why we still carry the wounds. That's why, you know, People still carry the wounds of the loss of their land and way of life. Métis people still carry that deep, deep wound of the things that happened to them, you know, being pushed off to the side of the road and, you know, people put on little packs of land, you know, reserve pass system and stuff like that. We still carry that pain. We still carry that hurt as Indigenous people. You know, and and those are the things that we're healing. Those are the things that we have to heal because it's in, in our history. We carry that intergenerational trauma. And those are the things we're working towards. You know, there was there was colonization, you know, the, re, the residential school, re, reserve pass system, you know, the 60s scoop, you know, and on and on and on. It's still, you know, continuing on today. And, you know, but we all have to heal together. We have to work together to heal together. We can't just say, well, you got to go and heal. We got to do it together as, as human beings because our earth is threatened. That's what we have in common, all of us together. You know what? If all the human beings were gone from this earth, Mother Earth would do just fine. She would continue producing, she would continue growing, she would continue doing whatever she needed to do. But if Mother Earth dies, we all die. Yeah, that's how fragile, that's how fragile we are. And that's what I know. That's what I know in my spirit, you know. So when I go out and I, you know, and I, you know, become a part of the land and you know, I, I sit on the land, I sing, you know, I pray, I give thanks, I roll on the land, I go out bare feet all summer. You won't see me with shoes and socks on walking around, I'm outside. And you know, that's our connection, right? Our connection to Mother Earth. You know, take off your socks and shoes and go stand on Mother Earth, even in the snow. It's okay. You know, we're not going to, you know, get sick. <laughs> you know, take off your socks and shoes and say your name. You know, tap your feet and say, say your name and tell Mother Earth, help me to remember who I am. Yeah, help me to remember who I am. And, you know, she will because everything that's in the earth is in our body. Everything that's in there is in our body. All the vitamins, the minerals, everything is in there that is, is in our body. That's why when we walk on the earth, we connect to her. Yeah, you'll never see a, a child that's unhappy that's running around bare feet. And we're the same. If we run around bare feet, we'll never be unhappy. Yeah, because we're connecting to the earth. And they even have this fancy name in some places. They call it earthing. <laughs> they call it earthing when they, when you know, go out and do some earthing. Yeah, but you know, really our ancestors knew that that we on the land and I've heard some beautiful Dakota stories about, you know, how the grandmother said, you got to sit on the earth. We're not above the earth. We sit on the earth when we make baskets or we do something, we sit right on the ground, you know, and we learn, you know, we learn from the earth and we feel that, we, you know, we feel that connection. Even some grandmothers will say, take off those rubber shoes. It's if you're going to get sick. Yeah. You know, so they say that because it takes your charge away. We need that charge of Mother Earth for our well-being. Yeah, we need that. It's part of, you know, it's really part of who we are. I know the land holds our stories. 
I went out and uh, when I lived in Crane River, I was again, always outside. I was always on the land. I always took my kids out. We had this place we called Louise Island. And in there, it, on that island, there was, I used to, my kids used to play there all the time. And I used to take them out that way. And there was this, like a, like a old foundation there. And this one time I was, you know, I was sitting on that foundation. My kids were playing. I was thinking, oh, what a relief, you know, just to let them play. And, you know, I was sitting on that foundation. It was a really beautiful summer day. And I was just sitting there and I could hear the kids in the distance. And the sun was coming through the trees and there was a nice cool breeze. And all of a sudden I had in, like something just went like this and I dropped, almost like I dropped. And all of a sudden, I had a vision in my mind of a woman. She was wearing a long dress, and she had kind of like an apron on. And she was making bannock for her for her kids. She was making lunch for her kids. Yeah, And you know, in those old cook stoves, I don't know if any of you have seen those old wood stoves, those old cook stoves, she had that, and she had the oven open, and she was throwing in that bannock like that into the oven. And that was so vivid in my mind. And I came to and I just like, the story was in that foundation. And it told me the story, those grandfathers that I was sitting on, told me the story of that woman in that house. She was so happy to be feeding her kids that day. She was happy, you know, and it just made me happy. And I kept that in my mind and my heart for a long time. I never ever told anybody I thought... I thought, you know, somebody's going to think I'm crazy, you know. Now I don't care if people think I'm crazy. <laughs> I don't care, so I'm just going to share everything. <laughs> yeah, so I know that the land holds our stories because the land teaches us. The land teaches us who we are. It's the land that tells us who we are. It's the land that tells the Dakota people who they are. It's the land that tells the Cree people who they are. It's the land that tells the Oji Cree people that who they are. Because even though we're all Cree people, our dialects will be different. Because the land teaches us the the land teaches us the language. Yeah, and it's it's taught through love. It's taught through love. Language is taught through love. That's why our, 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 our language is so beautiful. You hear our language, it's like somebody singing. Yeah, it's like somebody singing. I don't know my Cree, but if, like, I don't know, I can understand, especially the swear words. Of course, we always understand the swear words. So I always tell people, like, you better not swear at me in Cree because I know those words. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's so beautiful. Like, it's such a beautiful language. And even I hear, you know, like, you know, prayers in Dakota, prayers in Cree, like, you just know it's so meaningful and so rich because the language you could say one word and it'll mean this much it'll mean so much okay so the land teaches us who we are so when we want to know who we are we go and roll around on the land yeah because that'll help us that'll heal us you know that'll take care of us that'll you know um, um give us our you know meaning our purpose you know Take, go out on the land, spend time with your children, spend time with your grandchildren out on the land, tell them stories, tell them stories about the land. You know, where I really realized, you know, one time I went to go visit my uncle when I was a little girl, and uh, you know, my uncle was a fisherman up north in, in Thicket, and they used to fish for sturgeon. And that was something I loved to do. I loved to go and help. Hey, eh? I was like, you know, eight years old. I was a helper. I was going to go help my uncle. It's probably more in the way than anything, but I was a helper. And and uh, I was going down the lake. We said down the lake. I was following behind, and all the men were gone up ahead, and everybody's gone up ahead. They were going to go lift the nets, and and I was kind of lagging behind. And you know, as a child, in our innocent little ways. You know, it again, a beautiful summer day and the sun was coming through and you could see little particles floating in the, in the, you know, in the sunlight. And it was just nice and in your chill, in your childlike way. And then I realized in that moment that I was not separate from whatever was going on there, that I was part of all that. I just felt it and it lasted a few seconds. And then I just went, oh, and then I just carried on 
And that was another thing I kept to myself all those years. And I had forgotten it. I had forgotten it until I started doing my healing work. And that was a little secret that would help me, that would help me in my healing. And it would tell me, you know what, you know what, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Yeah. Because you're not separate from anything here. Yeah. You know, and that really, really, you know, really, uh, supported me through my healing and it still does today my husband and I we go out to the east side here in Brandon and we you know we do lodge we work together my husband and I he's such a beautiful beautiful man I just love him so much he's just uh I said I fell in love with him because he makes me laugh hey eh? yeah and we get along we get along really good but it wasn't always that way because we were healing we were healing he was healing from residential school and I was healing from 60 scoop so I always say our pain joined us together. Yeah, our pain joined us together. We were both going through a divorce when we met. And, um, and we were both on our healing journey. And we just kind of come together. And, um, um, you know, and we work on our healing. And then I went through the process with him through residential school, uh, you know, the residential school uh, payments and all of that. It was devastating for us. It was devastating for him. You know, it was devastating for me. Um, you know, we almost didn't make it as a couple because it was so painful. Yeah. Because, you know, I was in my pain. He was in his pain. Yeah. And it was so hard on us. But you know what we did? We went to the lodge and we'd go out on the land and we'd go pick medicines. And that's what we do. We go pick medicines. We go do sweat lodge. You know, we go sit out there. And that's where we're the happiest. Yeah, that's where we're the happiest when the two of us are out there on the land. We go all summer long. We go picking medicines. We go to the ducks. We go to Clear Lake. But it's getting harder and harder to find the medicines now. Yeah, we can't just go anywhere and pick medicines. We have to go way up north. Yeah, we have to go north. Yeah, to pick the medicines. And uh, we try to share whatever we have. We pick, you know, and we and we're learning too to talk to the medicine. We we're taught talk to the medicines. You know, they'll answer you. Yeah. And you know what? I haven't heard the voices, but I've had the inside feeling that that's enough now. Don't pick anymore. Yeah. So we go and pick. And then I'll tell my husband, okay, that's good. we got to move now. Yeah, so we move on to someplace else. So we try to have that respect and that kindness for the land and always, always carrying tobacco. We always put tobacco down. Wherever we pick medicines, we always offer tobacco. Whatever we ask for, we always give tobacco. And that's something, you know, my mom even told me that her, you know, my chat bag used to carry a little pouch and that tobacco was always there. And I never knew that until she told me, you know, she said that she would pull out her tobacco and she would go down right on her knees to the ground. And she would offer that tobacco and she would put it down and then she would go pick her medicine. You know, always that tobacco is first. We always have to, you know, honor that, honor that tobacco. So, you know, the land has been, you know, my saving grace and I know, you know, as human beings, we need the land. We need the land. We need the medicines. Everything comes from Mother Earth. Everything we have, everything, everything comes from the energy of Mother Earth. If we think about it, everything in our home comes from the energy of Mother Earth. Everything we eat, the medicines that we have, Everything comes from the energy of Mother Earth. And we have to start looking after it. We have to start taking care of it. You know, I, I teach my grandchildren, you know, teach my grandchildren about the land. Yeah, make them walk around bare feet. We pray, you know, we talk about the land and everything it provides. And them too, they call it Mother Earth. Yeah, my little kids and Grandmother Moon, they call it little Grandmother Moon. And, uh, you know, uh, my daughter, you know, my daughter, when the kids were small, she'd take them down to the river. And my little my little grandson would be throwing rocks into the river. And she'd say, what are you doing, my boy? Oh, nothing, Mom. I'm just throwing grandfathers. <laughs> we call little stones grandfathers, eh? So she said, yeah. You've been around granny too much. <laughs> it's picking up all these words. Yeah, but you know, we teach our kids and we want them, you know, we want to leave for them. You know, we want to leave for them, uh, um, you know, uh, earth that's abundant. 
and that's clean and you know the water like that's a whole other thing I know I'm probably going over here or pretty close um okay yeah so you know even the water and that's a whole other you know that's a whole other area that we could really be talking about you know and and sharing about um how we you know especially as women too were the care uh takers of the water yeah because the reason that we are the care caretakers of the water is because you know when we're carrying our children the water surrounds our baby yeah and we say in dakota i say mini uh in cree we say nipi or in you know ajibwe we say nibe yeah so water water of life if there was no water on this earth, there would be no life. And, you know, even when the treaties were signed, we say as long as the rivers flow, and that was part of it. It wasn't just about the rivers. It was as long as waters flow, as long as waters flow. So as long as there's life on this earth, those treaties will stand. You know, and when we look at the treaties, they are also done in ceremony. That's why they can never be broken, because they are done with spiritual law. We have to follow those treaties. They have to stand because they were done with the pipe. They were sealed with the pipe in ceremony under spiritual law. So we have to really pay attention. Otherwise, there will be consequences. You know, there's consequences for all of us. You know, so when we talk about reconciliation, when we talk about these things, that's why I say we have to do it together. We have to heal together. And we have to see each other as equal. Yeah, as equal, walking side by side with one another. Yeah, um, uh, working together, um, finding a way through things together, helping each other to heal. You know, uh, the you know the settlers too. They carry a lot of trauma. Yeah, they carry a lot of trauma. Not only indigenous people but settlers too they carry a lot of trauma it needs to be healed too and we need to start opening that up and healing that you know us we, we put everything on the table you know who we are this is who we are you know who I am what I'm saying here tonight this is who I am you know this is who I am I'm learning too I'm you know I'm on my healing journey too I want my children to be healthy and strong I want them to be happy and to be the best that they can be too. And whatever gifts that they have, that it can come to fruition. Yeah, so I work on my healing every day. It's not easy. Some days I feel like giving up. Yeah, some days I feel like saying to heck with this. I don't want to do this anymore. It hurts too much, you know. But each time, you know, each time we, we find strength, we find strength sitting on the land, drinking our medicines, talking about our, you know, our history, talking about our grandparents, our ancestors and what they went through. They suffered so we could live. Yeah, they suffered so we could live. So we continue on, you know, we try to continue on with that. So I know that, uh, you know, there's so much more I, I want to share, but I know I'm getting close to my, you know, my time here. I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for allowing me to share a little bit, um, you know, share a little bit today. I find it, you know, like cleansing, you know, I just find it cleansing. And I just appreciate every single one of you that are here today. And March, thank you so much for that beautiful prayer and for being here as the elder. And it feels comforting to know that you're there. Yeah, I, I feel really comforted to know that you're there. So um, my relative, Marge, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, if there's any questions or people have anything they want to you know, talk about, I'm right here. I want to say thank you, Deborah. I likely didn't realize just how entwined the family stories and stories of the land are, are so interwoven. Um, it, it, you've just really reminded me of that. And uh, uh, so many uh, my stories, for example, I, I forget to, to interweave them with my experience with the land or the land's experience with me. And mm. uh, so I thank you for, for reminding me of that. And uh, I think Carrie is going to somehow facilitate question period here. I'm not sure how you're going to do that, Carrie. Sure. So, thank you, Deborah. Yeah, be happy to. Um, 
So yeah, we have a couple questions already coming in. And if anyone else has a question, feel free to either put it in the chat um, and I will, um, and or if you uh, really aren't comfortable typing it in and really want to say something, maybe you can just put question in there and hopefully we can, uh, I'll call on you and we'll get a chance to do it that way. Um, but yeah, I'll add my, my words of thanks as well to Deborah. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your story and, and such uh, uh, candid and honest um, and um, inspiring words. I really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, we have a couple questions. One is, um, uh, the first question that came is, why is tobacco the gift that is given to the earth and elders and not to someone else and not something else? Why is tobacco the gift? Do you have any thoughts? Well, you know, uh, I was taught that tobacco is our first medicine that was on Mother Earth. So we we use the tobacco. It's the very first me medicine that was on the Earth. But if you don't have tobacco, sometimes, like if you're taking medicine and you don't have tobacco, sometimes a little bit of your hair will be okay. Yeah, if you want to use a little bit of your hair, you can do that too. But it's to offer something. Yeah, tobacco is one of our, you know, most sacred, most sacred medicines. And people, when they think of tobacco right away, they think of, you know, um, cigarette tobacco, right? But it's, it's that was not uh, like uh, our tobacco was not that. Our tobacco was, you know, uh, not for, you know, smoking. Um, we can get natural tobacco. Uh, you know, a lot of the elders today are saying they would rather have the natural tobacco because the other tobacco has so many chemicals in it, you know, and putting that on the earth and throwing that in the fire and that and people breathe that, you know, it's, it's not the best. So it's better to get the natural tobacco. And it's an offering we're giving, you know, we're giving something back for what we're doing. So we're being mindful and heartful. Yeah, when we do that. So we're saying, you know, thank you, Mother Earth, for everything you provide. Thank you for the medicine. I'm going to pick medicine and I'm thanking you for that. So you put a little bit of tobacco down. And then if somebody gives you tobacco and you accept that tobacco for something, that's a contract. That's a spiritual contract with that person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, there's always a way to correct it if something happens that you can't. But, you know, when somebody gives you tobacco, if somebody gives me tobacco to do something, uh, always follow through. Yeah, we follow through with that. It's 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 such a a, a powerful way. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate that. There's a, a lot of um, I don't know if you're seeing some of the things in the chat, the open chat, but there's a lot of uh, expressions of gratitude and thanks as well mm -hmm. that are coming through. So um, yeah. just to let you know that as well. Um, Another question that came is, do you see any evidence of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people coming together to protect our Earth? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I see that. I see that a lot. Yeah, people are starting to come together more. You know, we're starting to, we're starting to see each other. We're starting to, mm -hmm. when I say see each other, I mean heart to heart. Yeah. Usually when we, when we're doing talks like this, what, what I usually do is Zoom has been like, you know, uh, one way has been such an amazing way to get information and stuff. But you know, when we're sitting together like that, and if we're doing teaching, um, we would sit in a circle. Yeah, mm -hmm. we would sit in a circle with each other. And we're sitting together heart to heart. Yeah, mm -hmm. we all have a story to share. And we all have a story to tell, you know, mm -hmm. um, we're equal in the circle, there's nobody here. And there's nobody here. We're all equal in the circle. So when we sit together, you know, we're, we're talking that way. So, so we try to, uh, you know, um, and again, we're healing, right? We're all healing. Yeah. And we try to, you know, I try to, you know, when I'm working at, uh, like I work at the, you know, in the treatment center, I do teachings and things like that. And it's always open. Yeah, we always keep it open and try to keep it inclusive, because we really need to work together. We all need to heal together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a couple questions about um, medicines, particularly. One of them is about: Is it pesticides that have caused medicines to disappear? Um, and also, what were the plants and medicines that the midwives used for bleeding? Do you have any thoughts on either of those? Well, there, there. I can't give you a name. I could only maybe teach you the plant. <laughs> <laughs> don't know the name of them but you know pr probably pesticides but farming like all the land is in in crops so there's not a lot of places to get the medicine you know there's not a lot of forests around I mean 
you know, you go further south, like it's not easy to get the medicine and we don't pick medicine that alongside the road. Yeah, because we see sage growing all over around side the road, but it's sprayed like, you know, there's all kinds of chemicals and things. I mean, we go to the mountains to pick and we have to get a permit to do that. Yeah, we don't like picking from where, you know, anywhere where there's farmland, where the where there's runoff with chemicals and you see that. Um, I went to one, I saw one field, you know, just outside of Sioux Valley and the, it was all black. The land, they sprayed something and everything was black. And that's running over into our, you know, into our water and into, down into, you know, I'm looking at all my, you know, all the, I said, all the people in Sioux Valley, all that stuff is running off into, into Sioux Valley, you know, into the land, into the water, into the, you know, and that's our little kids are playing and, you know, so it just, it just makes me feel sad. I don't know, like, I'm not a scientist. I don't know how it works or I don't know if it just, you know, supposed to stay in one spot. I don't know, but I, you know, I just know that. It, it doesn't feel good it doesn't look good it doesn't feel good you know so yeah yeah certainly things are interconnected in really important ways and yeah, um, yeah. things we do to one area one one thing of the earth affect ever, affect everything else so yeah. for, sure. for sure thank you sure. yeah there's a question that came in from uh, Pastor Ken Queering. He asks, mm -hmm. thank you, Deborah, for your gift of teaching. This is meaningful and helpful. Can you talk more about needing to go further north to pick medicine? Is there less plant diversity in the south? And you just sort of talked about this as well, but where there's great, is there less diversity in the south where there's greater population density and industrial scale farming, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, just exactly what he said. Yeah, just exactly what he said. I go more north because it's more, you know, there's more bush. Um, mm -hmm. you know, east, I go east sometimes to go pick cedar, um, you know, where there's more bush, not a lot of, you know, where there's not a lot of farmland and things like that. So we go up north, we go to the mountains, um, uh, to pick medicines there. Um, yeah, we go up to the ducks, we go more north, it, we want sweet grass and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of, we kind of go up that way. And uh, I'm trying to learn more and more about the medicines, like I'm trying to learn more, um, you know, how they work in the body and, and what to heal. And, you know, if you go to an elder, you, you take tobacco and that and they go into the lodge and they pray you know, they pray and that medicine is made for that person, you know, they, they make the medicine for that person. I, I, I can't do that, but I want to learn like about the medicines and how it works in the body. I know like with Wicca, you know, I've had kind of a scratchy throat, you know, just mm. so I drink Wicca and it just takes it away. Like I have, I get ear sore ears. And if I, you know, drink Wicca, I, I you know, they, they go away. The sore ears go away. Yeah, so those mm. kind of things, and and that you know the lady who is teaching me, she's passed away this past year. It's really sad, but the lady who is teaching me says that you know pay attention to how the medicine works in your body. So that's what I'm doing, mm. is like whenever I take medicine, I I figure out what it's doing in my body, and so there's certain ones that you know I'll make the medicine and and drink it, and then all of a sudden all the phlegm starts to come out of my lungs. It's like oh my god, yeah. So, you know, that's good for a cold or, you know, that's good for uh, yeah. So my husband is my guinea pig sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> my poor husband. <laughs> Him too, he tries it on me sometimes too. It's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we help that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Another question that uh, came in is about uh, water. Um, and, and they say nipi is the is the is from the Cree word for water and water yeah. is life, of course. Um, yeah. And she's asking about rivers. Winnipeg is a city with a strong connection to water yeah. through her rivers. What does yeah. that mean to those who live here now and in the past? And I'm, I'm guessing it might also include questions around the pollution that's happening in the rivers and, and other yeah. kinds of questions, things like that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thoughts around water. Well, you know, the, the rivers are like, you know, are, are like the, you know, the veins of Mother Earth. Yeah, when we think about it, the rivers are like that, right? They're, they, you know, they're, we call them like the veins and arteries of, you know, of Mother Earth. And rivers were such an important, you know, uh, you know, things, you know, to, to carry, you know, to carry people down the rivers, things like that. And my husband says, you know, when he was a little boy, he said they used to swim in, in the river at Sioux Valley. He said they don't now. Because their their skin turns gray, yeah. Wow. 
they were little, he said they swam in there. And I thought, oh, that was really sad Yeah, that you can't swim in there anymore. You know, um, I lived along Lake Manitoba. So Lake Manitoba is still, you know, it was still fairly, you know, really nice, uh, clear, blue, beautiful water where we fished and things like that. But when I came this way, I was really surprised at, you know, all the pollution and you know all of that like the way the water looks and even in the spring out at the east site you know the way the water comes in and you know when the farmers are spraying and wh whatever runs off runs into the runs into the water and we can't find turtles anymore we, there used to be turtles all along there but there's no more turtles we don't see the turtles anymore yeah Wow. So yeah, you know, the rivers, you know, are, you know, when we think of the lifeblood of Mother Earth, you know, the water, the lifeblood of Mother Earth, water is life, like, you know, this young lady is saying here, um, you know, water is life, you know, and, and water, and when we think of the water, it's the same water that's been here ever since this earth began, it's the same water. That water goes back up and comes back down and goes back up and comes back down. There's a cycle. And I always imagined it. And this is something I've always, you know, thought of that there's a love affair. There's a love affair that happens between Grandfather Sky and Mother Earth, you know, and it's like a cycle like this. And we're part of that love affair that happens, you know, that the yeah. rain this goes back up and goes back down, goes, goes into the water. And water has memory because water is spirit. Water has memory. It remembers everything. And even, you know, scientists are, you know, computer programmers are using water for computer chips because it stores memory. Water stores memory. So, Everything that we go through, that's why the, the, the grandmother says that, you know, the land knows what you need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she'll grow that medicine for you because you're, you're, you know, whatever you deposit on the ground, Mother Earth analyzes that. And then she grows that medicine you need. You know, she cleanses the water. Yeah. And the water, you know, is part of that cycle. Right. And she loves us, too. She's our second mother. We had the mother who brought us to this, who brought us to this world. And then we have this world that we this earth that we sit on. And that's our mother. And we, you know, we were taught and I, I know probably Marge, do you have stories, belly button stories, you know, when when children are small, like, you know, a belly button, if you put your belly button out in the, you know, in the bush, your child will be a good hunter, or you put it on the anthill, your child will be a good worker. And, you know, and so we have like stories like that, right, that are are part of the earth and you know my my oldest son his grandfather took his belly button and went and buried it in the in the bush and you know what my son is a good hunter and a good fisherman and he's very responsible and he feeds the elders and he and he taught himself that I didn't teach him that he learned that in his own spirit he you know he taught himself that and I always say my girls are good workers because uh theirs got sucked up in the vacuum cleaner <laughs> It happened. <laughs> They're good workers. They're good workers today. But you know those kind of you know those kind of little stories, and uh, you know when when uh, your belly button you, you know your belly button falls off, some grandmothers would keep that, and you know in some of the Cree teachings they would keep that belly button until the child is about seven years old when they would remember. So the grandmother would take the child out on the land, and they would say, you know this belly button is what connected you to your mother and it fed your body mind and spirit and it fed you you know it it, it connected you to your mother and you know this is your kitsi your belly button and so you 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 now will be connected to mother earth and they bury that little belly button and that child will remember that story and that's how they get that connection to mother earth right because their little belly buttons buried in the you know buried in the earth and so we actually have two mothers yeah so we have our mother who gave us life brought us to this earth brought us to this world and then we have the mother who looks you know who who looks after us, uh, our mother earth. Hey? Yeah. So those kind of little stories, you know, that, you know, help us connect, they help us connect to the land and they help us appreciate and see that, you know, and have love and have love for mother earth. Yeah. Thank you. That was a beautiful story. I, I remember seeing an image of 
of an umbilical um, cord that looked like um, the, a tree, the, the roots of a tree for coming up. And I was like, that reminded me of what you're just saying, sharing. So yeah. that's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's a very quick uh, question, um, just referring back to your previous answer related to the sore throats, the, the, the asking if you can type the name of the medicine, or I can type it in for you. I don't know or say it again. I didn't catch the name of it. Um, well, in Cree, we say we guess. It's uh, in, in Ojibwe, they say we care. Mm -hmm. In uh, Dakota, uh, I forget what they what he, Frank calls it. Um, uh, I, he he calls it bitter root anyway, and uh, but I can't remember that what he oh. what he calls it. Yeah, but in it's uh. it's W I I just spell it W E E K A Y. It and we guess is uh, we E W E E G A S. We guess, and it's a uh, um uh, flag root. Flag root. Flag root. Okay. Yeah, it's flag root. And it's like they call it rat root too. They call it rat root because wherever you see like muskrat houses and beaver houses, you know that VK is around there because that's their medicine. Yeah, hmm. the rat and the, the muskrat and the beaver, that's their medicine. Yeah. Hmm. So that's wherever you see that. So it's it grows with the, you know, it grows with, with the the rat, the what are those long things called? Look, cattails. They grow with the cocktails. Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another question that came in: thoughts around uh, the times we're in, the COVID times. Have you had to change what you do when interacting with the land now during COVID times? Do you see any or suggestions on that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, you know what? Not changing too much with the land connection because it can still go out on the land and all that, but it's with the people. We can't be with the people. And that's been really hard. Yeah, because we're usually, you know, we go out to the land and we, you know, we're with the people a lot. We go out and sit on the, you know, in the lodge and, you know, we haven't been able to visit with family. Like I'm really lonesome. I get really lonesome. We haven't been able to visit with family and, and, um, you know, we're always doing something, uh, you know, with, with the people in the community. So that's been really hard. Yeah. But being on the land, no, we still go. My husband and I still go. I still walk, um, get fresh air every day. Um, I still go out, you know, we still go out picking medicine. We went out to pick cedar there a couple of weeks ago. We went out towards the east and, you know, packed a lunch and, you know, and went out and picked medicine. We didn't stop anywhere. You know, we just gassed up here and away we went and came back home the same day. But we haven't really, it hasn't really been a, uh, um, for us anyway, you know, um, we've still been out on the land quite a bit. And, you know, and that's something that I, you know, I really strongly recommend people, even if you can't, you know, go out on the land, if you can't be with people, because you won't feel that, you know, that lonely, lonely, lonely feeling if you get outside. Yeah, go on the land, lean against the tree. You know what, I have a maple tree in my backyard. It's huge. And I go lean against it. Yeah, I go lean against it because, you know, it straightens our spine and we're connected to the trees. Hey, we're connected and it and it helps you and and it teaches you. Yeah. And I guess I always say, if you want to know lots, go lean against an old tree. But if you only want to know a little bit, go lean against a young tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. That's actually um, really related to the, the other question that also came in. And, um, <laughs> With, uh, around urban and um, environments is asking, can you, many of the connections you spoke about with the land with more with natural environments, is there a similar connection with the land for people who live in urban environments? Mm -hmm. uh, suggestions of how do we do that as people in the cities? Yeah, go out in the yard, go out in the parks. Yeah, mm -hmm. go outside, just go outside, doesn't matter. I, you know, my, my daughter lives, my granddaughter lives in an apartment here. You know, I was trying to take the kids to the park. Yeah, do something outside. Yeah, find, you know, um, grow plants in your house. Yeah, do that. Grow plants. Start your tomato plants now. Put your tomato plants out, you know, start your, uh, make a, you know, I have plants in my house. My daughter too, she's all of a sudden just become this plant woman. You know, grow plants in your house, you know, do those kinds of things that really, um, 
boy, it's it's so amazing to to make plants grow. You know, I used to do that when I was in Cranham. I plant all my stuff in the spring and my table when my dining room table was full of, uh, you know, little plants, eh? Because I, I plant them and put them at the east window and, you know, they would grow and then I would plant them, you know, when it came time for the spring, you know, do things like that. Yeah. And connect yourself, um, uh, connect yourself to the land through that. Yeah. And remember, even if you're, you're secluded and you can't get outside for whatever reason, maybe you have a health issue, you can't get outside or, you know, whatever. Remember that everything that you're sitting in, everything that you're around, what you're wearing, what you're eating comes from the energy of mother earth. Mm -hmm. It just changes your thought like that. You know, you feel isolated and alone and you remember, oh yeah, you know, there's wood here. You know, there's, you know, I'm sitting on these chairs. It's made from the energy of Mother Earth. There's a plant sitting here. That's part of Mother Earth. That's, you know, all of these things are, you know, can help connect us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even if you have soil in your house and, you, and you're planting things, you, you, you're getting that in your hands. Yeah. You're getting that in your body. Do those kinds of things. Um, you know, all of, all of those things. I have flower gardens and I plant you know, I never grow, my vegetables never grow really well here, but I still plant them and I have flowers growing all over in the summertime. And, you know, I get my kids out, my grandkids out here planting stuff and, you know, and they just go, oh, granny, that's amazing. Look at that. You know, and they see their stuff growing, you know, and they feel that they feel that connection. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very simple. You know, sometimes we make things too complicated, I think, you right. know. And, you know, life is very simple. Like, you know, it's very simple to live. My husband reminds me of that all the time. He always says, life is simple to live, honey. You know, try to try to not take things so serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, the last question that was here was, I think, very similar to that. Can we follow your teachings anywhere? And I think that's kind of the the same what you were just saying i think in the in any environment we can follow those questions yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. we can yeah whatever whatever we're doing you know and mm -hmm. and you know remain connected and see each other yeah mm -hmm. look at each other and see each other and they you know connect with one another and look at each other in the eyes and say oh, i see you yeah because yeah. we all want to be seen hey we want somebody to see us we want somebody to say i see you i see you my girl i see you my boy mm. I, I understand your pain i understand and i understand your you know your your you know your love and you know all of those kinds of things we want to be we want to really be seen yeah see each other and you know we learn love we learn compassion we learn understanding for each other and mm. You know, and, and I really learned that working addictions. Like, I mean, such beautiful, amazing people come into the, you know, into the treatment center and and they just want to be seen. They want somebody to see. And they're just amazing, amazing people, you know. And I always say, you know, people who struggle in addiction, it's because of that, that they're struggling in addiction because of the wounds that they carry, you know. And, and we don't say only why, you know. We, we don't say why, the you know, why are you like this or why are you this way? We don't only look at the behavior but we say why the behavior why because of the wounds that we carry the wounds that people carry you know so mm -hmm. see each other you know see each other look at each other and you know so mm. Mm. thank you mm -hmm. um i'll just add one other question as well that i was thinking about you talked a lot about language and how important language is to you and i think um, I think it was maybe in Robin Walkimer's book on braiding sweet grass. She talks about how, in, particularly in Anishinaabe Muin and, and other, and maybe Cree as well, they, there's a lot of verbs and a lot of really, the, the language is really about thinking about um, active um, ways of, uh, and alive, like anime, yeah. animation, right? Um, and that there's like 70% in English of is nouns, but in other, in your language, it's more 70% of verbs. And I'm yeah. wondering if, if that, um, shapes in any way your connection to the land and for those of us that, that only speak English is there a way to reconnect in that way as well definitely because it's always an action you see hmm. it's always an action you see when somebody says something and you know that's something that I learned with my with my husband <clears throat> is that you know when I ask him a question and me I talk like real fast and you know I, I answer really quickly but yeah. him when I talk ask him a question he, ha he, st he stops and, you know, he, he takes him a long time to answer. 
And I used to think, geez, you're rude. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just kidding. But I used to think like, you know, but I realized he's thinking because he sees an action and he's translating it from Dakota to English. Mm-hmm. And how does he, you know, so, you know, it's always an action. And I have a friend that, you know, she's Cree here too. Um, and she speaks Cree. So she's trying to teach me a lot of words, eh? That's the one I always tell her, don't you swear? Because I know the swear words. She's always, <laughs> so I always, you know, and that's what she says. So I ask her, what does this mean? She says, oh, I see a picture in my mind. She said, there's a picture, like an action. So there's always an action, right? There's always, you know, there's always something. They see a picture in their mind. So, yeah. So language is, you know, language is the culture. Like there's so much in the language so you know losing the language that's huge like losing the language my mom spoke fluent Cree, but she never spoke to us in Cree. yeah mm. you know she never you know never spoke to me in Cree, and you know and it, Cree was my first language and through everything you know i kind of lost that ability and a lot of our people too they're immersed in english and even dakota Cree, dene you know, they're starting to lose their language and they're losing a syllable all the time. Yeah. So say, for instance, um, um, I'm doing uh, teachings on uh, traditional parenting tomorrow. Waspison. Uh, Waspison is like the, the, the moss bag. And, and so they, they, they're losing a syllable. So it's was, wasipis. I can't remember exactly how, but there's one syllable that's missing. Yeah. If you go to the old, old Cree, they'll, they'll give you the right translation. So we're losing a lot of our, you know, and we're losing in the translation from English back to Cree. We're losing the stories. Yeah. And that's a sad thing. We're losing the stories from English back to Dakota. Yeah. So we lose the stories. Hey, yeah. So that's, you know, that's the sad thing. So I guess that's why, you know, our elders are trying to really bring the languages back because of that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, but that's a really good question. And I love the book Braiding Sweetgrass. I, I got to read it again because the first time I just gobbled it up. Now I'm, I'm going through it again and just rereading it. It's so such a good book. Yeah. yeah it's such a good book. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I think we're nearing the end of the time. Um, there was a very quick question that came in. Someone asked, were you being literal when you said people plant placenta in the earth here in Manitoba? I assume you were yep. being literal. Yeah. Yeah. Like we point. are. I, I went to a ceremony one time. My sister-in-law um, did a placenta ceremony where she buried her grandson's uh, placenta under the tree. And and what what it does is it honors that because when we think of the placenta and the you know the umbilical cord that that we grew that as women to nourish our children to nourish our babies and so the grandmother put that back to the earth there's no such thing as as um, you know before there was no such thing as postpartum any of that kind of stuff because there was so much support for women there was so much support. There was the ceremony, the grandmother looking, you know, looking after everything, the support from the aunties, from the women in the community. There was a lot of that, you know, support. Yeah. So, so it's been very, you know, enlightening for me, especially with the traditional parenting and what, you know, what the grandmothers used to do for our, for our children, um, because they understood what they needed to grow to be healthy and strong. So they put them in a little moss bag. Yeah. And that moss bag would, would nurture them at least for the first year of their life. And that was with help with brain development, um, help because that transition from the spirit world to this world, you know, they, it had to be gentle, loving, and kind. Yeah. So that was, you know, so those kind of teachings, you know, we're trying to really bring those back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Deborah. You've given us a uh so much to think about and to uh, learn from. And uh, I hope we meet again and uh, yeah. maybe in person. And, uh, yeah, that would be nice. Make glitch. Yeah. And uh, Marge, I'm just wondering if you could close our gathering um, with a prayer or whatever. And uh, just remind people that next week, uh, March the 4th, we're going to gather again, same time. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Yeah. Welcome to all of you and thank you to all who have attended today. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I wanted to say thank you to Deborah for her wonderful talk. And uh, one of our spiritual leaders always says, you know, Mother Earth is not a resource. Mother Earth is a source of life. And so when you think about it that way, it, it really carries a lot of weight. But that's what uh, I've been told all along. So we honor Mother Earth and the life that she gives us. So I'm going to uh, give thanks for the ability to get together and to hear Deborah speak and share her teachings. And I will say a blessing for everybody. Thank you.